Hey, my name is Matt, and today I'm going to show you a real quick uh, color correction tutorial. I'm not going to go into much detail. Um, I'm going to try not to anyway. Um, try and keep this down to about 15 minutes. So what we're going to do is have a look at how I uh, color graded this scene. Um, you can download this from my blog, mattscottvisuals.com. Um, it'll be under the download section. And you can download the raw image sequence, so you'll be able to work with the exact same files that I'm working with which are the 12-bit raw cinema DNGs from the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. A camera that I freaking love. It is sick, especially if you want good dynamic range, um, amazing post abilities, and uh, yeah, it's just a fucking sick little camera. So get on that shit, it's mad. Um, here's the end result, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, a lot of people are going, oh, you know, what lots did you use? Um, having trouble grading footage from Blackmagic, blah, 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 and like, yeah, I've had the camera for about two months, three months now, and um, before I got an IR cut filter, I had some trouble with the grading, but once I got this IR cut filter, um, everything changed, so make sure you check out my blog, mattscottvisuals.com, somewhere yeah, you'll find it, and um, the latest blog post, I talk about the IR cut filter and what it does, um, basically removing in, um, infrared contamination to make your blacks black, and to take that sort of brown tinge off um, the footage that you make. Be used to seeing on the internet but anyway let's get let's hurry up and get started i'm already already rambling and i'm not going to re-record this like if i fuck up or if i'm stuttering i don't care i'm just going to keep rolling with it because it's just too time consuming otherwise <laughs> anyway if you want to check out the full resolution version go to here and uh, you'll see it hd in glorious hd looks pretty sweet but you don't even need to see that because you're going to grade the actual high resolution image yourself in davinci resolve so go ahead and download the latest version of davinci and make sure you download the Cinema DNG sequence from the blog. And then, what you want to do is import the footage. So to do that, you want to go over here to your hard drive section. Um, on the Media tab, you'll notice there's four tabs down here. So we want to start on the Media tab. And if your hard drive is not here, um, or if the location that you saved that footage to is not here, you need to add it. So to do that, let's go to DaVinci Resolve, go to Preferences. And then we want to go to Media Storage and add the hard drive that you don't see there. Pretty annoying stuff. But that's that's how that's how they we it's just shit that you have to do that. Who cares? This it's free. The program is free. So whatever. Let's have a look. Um, and uh, I've saved the footage here, and here it is here. So even though it is a sequence of lots and lots and lots of um, twelve-bit still images, um, DaVinci will recognize that as a file or an image sequence, um, which is fantastic. So. The workflow is pretty easy, especially if you've got a monitor, uh, moderately new PC. So normally I would edit that out and like have to make this tutorial all fancy, but fuck that shit. We're just gonna roll with it. So just drag that from the bin, because once you've uh, grabbed it from your hard drive, put it over here, drag it down into the bin, and then we go to the edit tab. Uh, just before we do, let's just go back and just have a look. So we're 1920 by 1080, um, 23976, and it's a DNG, telling us that it's 16 bit, Really? It's not 16-bit. It's 12-bit, but it's sort of upscaling it and doing some fancy shit to put it into a 16-bit container. Oh, good. You're not going to notice the difference. Well, I don't anyway. So let's go to the Edit tab, and uh, now you can see that we have our clip here ready to be added to a timeline, but we don't actually have a timeline yet. We've got a space for a timeline, so what we want to do is just right-click on the clip and go Create Timeline using Selected Clips. It's going to say, what do you want to call it? We want to call it Mad Shit, and we want to create new timeline. And then here we go. We've got a timeline down here. We've got our clip. It's playing back in real time. It's freaking sweet. But it looks shit. Look at it. It looks terrible. So let's go to the color tab and have a look um, what's going on here. So we've got this uh, scrubbing section here. We can play the footage. We can loop the footage. Blah, blah, blah. We've got color correction down the bottom here. We've got our um, three-way color corrector, which is awesome. Uh, we've got curves here, which is pretty cool. And um, obviously just blazing, blazing over this stuff, but I cover it in much more detail in another tutorial. Go and have a look at that on my blog as well. Um, we've got the qualifier, the masks, the tracker, the sharpen and softness, the key, which is basically the opacity of um, certain parts of the layer. And um, then we can zoom in, rotate, and do heaps of cool shit here as well. So, I mean, this piece of software is free. It's freaking awesome. And we're gonna get into having a look at how um, we got this look um, it's, it's a very different look to this. I mean, look how shit that looks. Um, so, the first thing we're gonna do 
is um, we're going to crop this so it looks like the 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio that this one is. And um, I framed it like that in camera. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, instead of actually going here and going to edit sizing and you know cropping the top off like so, something like that, that's a shit way of doing it because then what you're doing is you're producing still a 1920 by 1080 image with black bars. But what we want to do is we want to create 1920 by 808 image, so an actual 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio. So let's go to the settings. And you'll notice in the master project settings, we have a timeline resolution of 1920 by 1080. Let's go ahead and change that to, uh, where is it? Custom at the top. And then we can go for 1920 by 808. Let's make sure we have square pixels. This is important because we are wearing with, working with aspherical lenses and we did record square pixels. Um, we can't change the frame rate, but it's all right because the frame rate matches um, our clip, which is fantastic. Next thing we're going to have a look at is the image scaling because if we just press save and let's go ahead and do that right now let's just press save don't worry about those stupid messages that my computer's fucking up um, you'll notice that we have this um, awesome 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio but DaVinci is deliberately um, shrinking the image down to make sure we don't lose any of our picture thanks for that DaVinci but um, we don't want that to happen so we want to go to the image scaling and we want to go down to mismatch resolution files because we indeed are mismatching our resolutions here um, we want to scale this image to uh, fill the frame and crop anything that it is scaled. So let's go ahead, press save, press OK to that crap. You, you shouldn't see those messages. And uh, now we've got a nice 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio framed exactly the way I framed it on the day. So first thing um, that I notice about this image, if I was looking at it and I didn't shoot it, I'd be like, well, for one, it's too warm. And two, what the hell is this clipping highlight shit? No one clips highlights. That's bad. Well, it is kind of bad, but I deliberately did it. And, um, you know, I like to sort of test what I think I know. And one of the things that I think I know is you don't clip highlights ever. But in this instance, um, and this was during a workshop that I was running, teaching people how to, or how I light and how I shoot and how I think on set, um, I was talking about the importance of not worrying about clipping highlights if those highlights aren't important. And... Um, this whole workshop was based on ultra low budget, low time. So for example, once we had the lighting setup done, uh, which I'm going to go to um, into detail, into not so much detail in a second, um, yeah, we had this clipping highlights on his shirt and clipping highlights outside in the window. And, you know, the, the point of doing that was to have a better exposure on his face. His face is more important than the exposure on his um, shoulder from the backlight here. If I was to rescue that and make sure that that wasn't clipping, then his face would be another whole stop, maybe even two stops, underexposed. So then I'd have to bring that back with a power window. It's going to look noisy. Fuck that shit. Don't worry about clipping highlights as long as you know what you're clipping. Yeah, that's the end of that rant. <laughs> so the other thing is um, it's super, super duper yellow. Um, if we look at this shot, it's nice and neutral. And um, so how do we go about fixing stuff like that? Well, the beauty of RAW. This is what is so sick about this little camera. The fact that it shoots for those tiny little SD cards and it shoots RAW. RAW is just um, this word that gets thrown around these days and it just means high quality. Well, to me, it doesn't really mean high quality because you can shoot really high quality ProRes too. You can shoot high quality um, XAV XAVC HD, whatever the hell it's called, or H.264. What RAW does is it allows you to push things around and change things, it gives you more flexibility later on. That's all RAW does, really. I mean, in terms of quality-wise, or sharpness, or detail, um, you will get slightly better detail with RAW, but it's more about the flexibility, and I'm going to show you that flexibility right now. So to access the RAW data in this uh, clip, we need to click on this camera here. And then we're going to decode. Um, we're not going to decode the RAW using the project. We're going to decode using the clip. If we do that, it gives us access to things like exposure values, sharpness values, um, the color temperature of the clip, um, things like this. So we can also change things like ISO, which is pretty cool. So I can make that say 200 ISO, all of a sudden the image goes darker. I can make it 400 ISO, which is the way I shot it. But uh, the biggest thing here, apart from the yellow, is the fact that we're looking at a color space of Rec. 709, a gamma space of also Rec. 709. What this is kind of um, doing is replicating a LUT. Well, you know, when I'm using the word LUT to try and make it easy to understand because everyone knows LUTs these days, right? I want them LUTs um, <laughs> to make my footage look good. But basically what this is, um, is a lookup table that makes a log image look good. 
Um, let's just leave it at that. <laughs> so when I'm monitoring the footage, I'm paying close attention to my scopes on the camera. Um, but it's not very nice to monitor a log image because you can't really see what it might look like. So I monitored in Rec. 709, but we can always change that. So let's go ahead and change that to BDM Film, which is Blackmagic Designs Log Mode. When you do that, um, everything looks shit, um, but everyone knows these days that shit is good when it comes to flat, right? Everyone wants to shoot flat because now we've got more freedom in post. Yes, so now we actually do have more freedom in post. Um, but, but I just want to switch back to Rec. 709 for a second because what we want to do is fix the white balance issue looking at Rec. 709. So before we start color grading using DaVinci's tools, we're going to start color grading um, by processing our film stock. Uh, that's how I like to look at this section here. Here we are in the lab and we're about to process the film that we've shot before it gets into post-production, which is over here. So while we're processing the film, do we want to push it or pull it a stop? Well, I want to leave it at 400 ISO. That's what I needed for and that's what I'm happy with. Um, do I want to... Um, I want to change the white balance as well. So to do that, we need to go to the white balance. Instead of as shot, we're going to change it to custom. And just keep in mind that if I was to change this back to BDM film and try and play with this white balance, it's pretty hard to see any change at all, right? So it's not a very useful um, correction tool if you're monitoring a, a color temperature white balance change in BDM film. So let's change that back to Rec. 709 and now you can see a drastic difference when I slide that back left and right. So I think of what was around uh, 5600, something like that, and tint should be zero. Point is, um, I did balance it for daylight and it looks shit ass. Looked good in camera, but um, this is the beauty of RAW. What we want to do is we want to balance this closer to tungsten. Tungsten is 3200 Kelvin. Let's type in 3600. I found that that was a, a sort of a nicer range, maybe even 3800. Just warm it up a little bit. And um, the tint, um, what I'm looking for with tint is basically, um, I couldn't be bothered really explaining this in too much detail, but <laughs> the color temperature to the left is blue, the color temperature to the right is orange, right? So these are the basic um, colors that planet Earth emits. Um, but then there's these other colors that human um, created light sources emit, like fluorescent lights, um, like coatings and lenses can fuck this shit up. The point is that um, sometimes a color balance shift alone is not enough to correct the white balance issues and you need to adjust the tint as well. So a tint represents um, green and magenta. These two colors don't typically, they're not emitted from Earth's um, light sources. <laughs> so we have this um, correction value that allows us to add or subtract green or magenta. So. Um, I'm looking at my scopes over here, and if I move this, uh, first of all, let's um, put this back to 3800 Kelvin, and let's move our tint around. So I'm basically just trying to neutralize this image as much as possible. So I'm sliding it back to the left here. You'll notice my um, blues and greens and reds are sort of separating when I go to the left, uh, to the right. But if I go to the left, they sort of start coming closer together. And this is good. I'm looking at skin tones, I'm looking at gray areas, and I want them to be neutral. We're just going to do a rough job here. There is a more technical, uh, proper way to do this, but we don't have time today. I don't have time for this shit. So, looks pretty good. Next thing is these clipped highlights, right? So then I white balance, and uh, while we're um, while we're at it, let's change this color space back to BDM film, okay? And let's have a look at these highlights. Can you rescue them? Sort of. You can't because they're clipped. Just because our uh, histogram. Uh, waveform monitor shows something below 1023 which is pure white doesn't mean it's not clipped it was still recorded above 1023 it was still recorded above what the sensor can see so these areas here are clipped there's no information uh, right here on his shoulder doesn't matter what we do with this we go down to 200 ISO bring the highlights all the way down to zero we're still got holes in this footage so that's that's the cost of clipping highlights right but I knew that and we did that deliberately so how do we make this image look good? Remember, this looks fine. No one's going to look at that and go, oh, look at those horrible clipped highlights. Maybe they will. Point is, there's only so much you can do in here, right? So we've balanced our image-ish, and um, we can try and you know bring gently bring down highlights a little bit if we like. But I, I tend to do this sort of stuff in Resolve itself. Um, the other thing you can do, I like to do, is take sharpness to zero. Um, this is sort of like a pre debarring sharpener. This is sharpening during the processing. I like to add sharpness to areas. 
Um, my philosophy with sharpness is, what's the point of sharpening everything in the frame? You don't want people to look at this back wall with great detail, do you? I mean, very generally, very rarely would I want to sharpen every single pixel. I only want to sharpen his face or sharpen the pen or sharpen the cigarette. You know, that's my idea of sharpness. So what's the point of adding sharpness here? Fuck that shit. Let's back that off to zero. And let's go ahead and get started in the grade. So first thing I want to do um, after I've processed my image in the darkroom is um, get away from this camera icon, go back to this color grading icon here. And um, I'm going to open the curves panel because what we want to do is start playing with the luminance values of our image. Now I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I always end up going into too much detail. Bottom left hand corner represents your shadows, right? Top right hand corner represents your highlights and everything in between represents everything in between. The cool thing is with the curves, you can lock off certain areas and only affect the luminance values of those areas. How sick is that? If you right click on one of these points, they disappear. What we're gonna do is grab um, a anchor point or place an anchor point in the shadows, push it down. We're also gonna place an anchor point in the highlights and push it up. So if you do that, it looks kinda better. We've created some sort of contrast, but it looks a little bit shit. So I want you to go in there and just massage a level of contrast that you like. So we're having a look over at our scopes, making sure that we don't go below zero or crush this stuff to zero. Because then, you know, you're clipping information. But maybe that's what you want to do. Keep that in mind as well. Um, there's no hard and fast rules. So I think this is looking pretty good. I'm trying to um, remember those highlights. Look how sort of harshly they can clip depending on your curve, right? If you have something like this, it's sort of like a quite a hard edge there. But if you sort of do it like this, maybe. It's sort of a bit gentler. Okay. Not bad. So now that we've got our contrast, we can press Control D for deselect. Um, you can see the difference. Um, here's our original image after the um, processing in the dark room. If we press Control D, that's just disabling this node. Disable that node, and that shows us the um, image before we added this color correction. Enable it again, and it shows us what we've done with this curve. You'll notice that it's actually quite blue all of a sudden, and that's because I accidentally um, fucked with this a bit earlier, so let's just reset that. So, Control D on and off. Now we've got contrast. Beautiful. That's bringing it um, better. It's bringing it to a nicer place. The next thing I want to do is add saturation to this image. Now there's two ways of adding saturation in Resolve, or three or four, but there's two main ones. One of them is in the, uh, the pre-processing room in the processing lab, <laughs> um, and we can go to the saturation, we can just increase that to 100%. So what's the difference between doing that and increasing saturation here? Well, let me prove to you right now, not a great deal. If I just grab a still of that, right click, grab still, that's gonna add a still here, which saves all the color correction. Um, and then I reset that back to 50, and then I go to the um, processing lab and I change this saturation to 100. And then I can double click on this still, and that will bring it up here. Ah, oh, fuck you. See, normally I would have to restart this tutorial, figure out why my drive is disconnected, and blah, blah, blah. The point is, <laughs> you can <laughs> compare these two images, and you can see that there's a bee's dick of difference between adding saturation here um, or adding saturation here. So, um, for the sake of this tutorial and to keep things moving, we're just going to leave the saturation in the, post in the pre processing lab at 100. Next thing we're going to do, okay, so we've added saturation, we've added contrast, things are looking okay. Um, but the problem is, if we have a look at our final shot, where is it? You'll notice it just looks better. Like, there's a few reasons why it looks better. Um, but one of the main reasons it looks better is because the focus is more centered. Um, and that's very important when shooting, when lighting, uh, when framing, and when color grading as well. What is the focus of this scene? Okay, so we've got desks on the side, we've got some shit in the front here, we've got a coffee, we've got a bright window in the background and some wicked ass old vintage um, walls back here. But the actual focus of this story and this image is him. I don't want you looking at that shit, maybe for a brief moment, but the whole point of this shot is this dude here, Reese Manning, freaking awesome actor, worked with him a few times, you're a legend. Um, yeah, thanks for helping us out with this workshop, dude. Anyway, so focus, how do we create focus? Well, thankfully in Resolve, um, we've got what's called secondary color correction, and we're going to use a mask to create focus. So let's click on the mask, which is the third one across. Sorry, get rid of that. See, normally I'd get rid of that as well. Start the tutorial again. Let's click on the mask, click on the circle. Now, if I do that, uh, what the hell's going on? We've got a mask here, which is fantastic, but it's only masking 
our new color correction. So we want this mask to be on a separate corrector. So let's go ahead and undo that. And what we're going to do is Alt S for Sam or Alt S for serial node. And that's going to add another serial node out here. So our first node is over here. If we double click on that, it's got a red line around it. Second node is here. This one has no color correction added to it just yet. What we're going to do is add a circle. Now the circle is cool because once we have a circle there or a circle mask, we can then go to the curves again and we can brighten it or darken it or we can make it a different color. Pretty cool. So in other words, we can localize a color correction. So let's double click on this second node, go to the mask tool, turn the window uh, circle one off and instead of using a circle we can use a square. Now this square is pretty cool. Um, if we use the wheel button on our mouse we can scroll it backwards, zoom this shit out. Um, better still, whenever working with mask, is if you press shift F for Fred, um, then you get a much bigger window. So what we're going to do is we're going to reshape and position this mask. Um, so what I'm going to do is try and emphasize this shaft of light that's not there. <laughs> um, so what I've done is created a shape, pretty rudimentary shape here, um, but you'll notice that outside of these main um, shape mover dots, there's this extra dots, these red ones. What they allow you to do is soften the edge of this mask. So if you press Shift H while the mask is on, you can actually see what's being softened and what's not. So what I want to do is create a super duper soft um, thing here like so and um, yeah let's just go ahead press shift H to turn the selection off shift F to get back to our normal view and let's go to our curves and now let's have a look if we do this we go up and down you can see we're almost creating this like we're almost relighting the scene um, that's pretty cool pretty cool so this is what I did um, is exactly exactly what I did um, to create that look from before and we're not going to make it exactly the same as before but I'm going to make it something similar, right? You are master of your own domain. You can make your own color grade. <laughs> um, you can tell me my shit. I did a David Fincher style look one this morning, but nah. I don't know. You know how he's like super duper dark, way less contrast than this. Um, and green. Looked all right, I guess. Anyway, so that's looking okay. It's looking better. So we've added contrast in two ways now. We've added contrast with a simple contrast curve globally, and then we've added contrast using a focusing window. Another cool thing about Resolve is um, now that we've drawn that mask, and if you click on the mask icon, you can see the shape of it there. If we want to affect everything outside of the mask, all we do is right click on that and choose Add Outside Node, and that creates a special node. There's an exact opposite of this node. So if we double click on that second node, and we go back to our curves, now we can actually darken everything outside of that. That's pretty cool as well, right? But you gotta be careful, you don't want this shaft to be too punchy, to be too noticeable. You don't want people to be like, ah, I see what you did there. You put a mask in Resolve, I know Resolve. <laughs> so, we don't want that shit. And um, I mean, it's pretty bad here, but we don't have time, I don't have time for this shit. <laughs> I'm gonna add another node. I'm getting old and grumpy. So here's the fourth node. We've added a fourth node by double clicking on the third one and pressing Alt S to create a new serial node. Now what I'm going to do is add another mask, a serial, um, a circle node, sorry. And I'm going to soften that one big time. Let's push it down here. And I'm going to inverse the mask. So if I press this button here, it's automatically going to focus on the outside of that shape. So we go to our curves. Check this shit out. So I'm just going to darken the whole scene off a little bit. Looking pretty cool. And then I'm going to go Alt S again, add another node, and this time I'm going to go mask again, Shift F. It's going to get me into this mode here. Shift F goes back again. So what we want to do is click on a circle, and I'm going to draw a very small circle, and it really helps to go Shift F in this case, zoom in and um, get this shape just right. What we want to do is just create a very small shape, like so, um, and we're doing this to help the tracker because what we're going to do is track this guy's face. So if I was to draw a mask uh, like this, which is what I eventually want, something like that, and I, um, and I go to my uh, tracker here and I track this shot, um, the tracker's going to have a pretty tough time sometimes. You'll notice that it has a, a tough time, a tougher time. It has more pixels to deal with and more shit that's going on. Um, so instead of doing that, what I like to do is, uh, let's go back to Shift H and let's scrub back here, find a frame like this. And I just want you to create a much smaller mask like so. And now, 
just around his eyes. Something with contrast, that's the key. With contrast. And um, now what I want you to do is track this shot. So what do you do um, after you've done that is you click on this motion tracker icon, which is the fourth one across. And let's untick the zoom box because this image doesn't really zoom in or out. He's not moving back or forward, right? And what we want to do is just start tracking forward. So we press the play button and check it out. It's tracking. Now, if you press Alt D, it's going to disable all of the other nodes. And now your tracking just sped up a shitload. And that's because we've just disabled all the color correction and your computer has less to think about. So basically, if you're doing any tracking, it's always good to disable all of your color corrections. And that's going to give you better performance uh, for that node. We probably should have disabled 3D as well. Maybe you can experiment with that. That's a new feature in Resolve 12. The tracker is just overall better. So now we started our tracking at this point, we want to reverse the tracking as well. So let's click, let's drag this icon, uh, this timeline indicator back to where we started that first track. Somewhere there, and then click reverse. And now that's going to track backwards. Ooh, problem. So look what happened here. The folder crossed his face during the track, and DaVinci just stopped everything and goes, no, nah, fuck this shit, can't do it. So what we're going to do now is click this frame button, which is really cool. This allows you to um, sort of jump in there and go and give DaVinci a bit of a hand. So we'll click on frame. And now what happens is if we move this, if we click on this mask, it's automatically going to add a keyframe for that position, rotation, size, all that sort of crap. So what we want to do is just put that back on his little nose bridge there. And um, let's scrub forward, oh sorry, back in time to where the folder is not in shot and then put it back on the forehead again, rotate it to how it should be. And then we can go back to clip and click reverse again, problem solved. Uh, it screwed up a little bit there as you can see, but it should be okay. We're just making a real basic soft mask here just to relight his face and add a little bit more punch to that bouncing light coming off the white sheets. Speaking of bouncing light coming off the white sheets, let's have a quick look at the lighting setup um, that I did here with the crew. So here's the beautiful little tiny camera on this massive tripod. Um, you know, fuck the red skeleton. We don't need it anymore, <laughs> right? And uh, we've got this 300 watt tungsten for now bouncing into a whiteboard here, which is adding some fill into the room. You can see that on his face there and on the side of the cabinet. Then we've got this backlight, which has a CTB gel on it to create a daylight colored effect, which is matching the same colored light coming from this double diffuse LED overhead, which is being cut off the side of the room to maintain contrast. So that is the lighting setup. Obviously, I've oversimplified that and gone over it way too quickly. But here is a much more detailed view. Get out there, start practicing lighting. It's fucking sick. It's one of the most important things of cinematography. Don't stop practicing. Don't stop trying shit. Don't be afraid to fail. <laughs> I'm going to start using the word life journey soon. So we've tracked our shot. Great. Now this thing sticks to his face. Once that's happened, make sure you don't have frame turned on. If you do, it's going to add a keyframe and it's going to animate over time. We want to make sure it's on clip. Okay. Now we can reshape this. Let's go back to Shift F mode and we can soften it. And if I just reposition it, hopefully that's going to look okay. Let's just scrub through here. Not really. Um, but you know how to fix that um, keyframe by keyframe now, right? So hopefully you track this a little bit better than I did. I'm just going to make it smaller. Maybe that's going to help my cause. We don't have time for this shit. <laughs> okay. Shift F goes back. Alt D will enable and disable all grades. Make sure you're on the final node here, which is the one with our new mask. Go back to the curves and check it out. We're just going to add a bit more bounce to his face. We're gently going to add some bounce, remembering that I did actually soften this mask because if you don't soften it, you're going to get this very hard edge and it's going to look shit out. So make sure, oh, shift F. Make sure you soften the crap out of that. All right, so things are looking pretty good. We are grading the, the absolute shit out of this. It's looking awesome. The beauty of raw, huh? But we don't even need raw. It just did really help with that white balance issue. Um, yeah, and exposure and all that sort of thing. But you can do this ProRes, no worries. I actually did record this scene in ProRes too. Graded it in ProRes, no problem. Although the white balance was a lot more difficult um, to fix. So that's basically what I did um, in this other grade that you may have seen on the blog. Um, obviously, I spent more time on this, did a much better job. Did a skin qualifier as well. We don't have time for that shit today. Um, but what we do have time for is one last thing. And um, I just want to quickly cover what's important about this shot 
and why it works so well. It has to do with the color palette. So you got this beautiful magenta curtain. You got this magenta-ish um, skin tone. And then you've got yellow in the scene. So we've got yellow and magenta. Basically, they are our two main colors in the scene. Whenever you have more than two main colors, shit can start looking shit. Um, that's just something to keep in mind. Obviously, I'm oversimplifying that as well. But two major colors complemented by grays, blacks, and whites. So we have a white t-shirt, we've got gray cabinets, and we've got blacks in the shadows and his hair. So if you keep that in mind, I look at any good looking image, um, any Hollywood film that looks awesome, I mean, except some of Wes Anderson stuff, which is a little bit different, but typically speaking, two colors that complement each other or work well together, and the rest is a monotone image. The rest is black, white, and gray. So what I did in this shot, um, in Da Vinci is I had a quick look at it and I said oh where are all the yellows there's too much yellow in here even though I balanced it using my white balance these um, mustardy yellow colored drawers just look shit so what if I turn them to gray so I'm gonna add um, another node now so I'm gonna alt s and add another serial node here I'm gonna go to my mask I'm gonna go to this custom shape tool and I'm just gonna quickly in shift F mode draw a, a real crappy quick shape just to give you an idea of what, what I did Okay, pretty cool. He's an awesome shape. Thankfully, the camera doesn't move, so we won't have to track that. Um, we can just soften it up a little bit, especially on the inside. Um, but what we can do now is just desaturate that. So let's go to the saturation and back it off. Look what an amazing difference that does to the scene. I don't know really why, but it has something to do with color. <laughs> Research that shit figure it out. I don't know. But I practice this shit all the time. I think about it all the time. You should too. Something as simple as that completely transforms this whole shot. Yellow, gray. Yellow, gray. Fuck yeah. Get on this shit. Another thing you can do um, is create a skin selection. So um, the best thing to do if you're ever doing selections like based on, you know, qualifications of skin, highlights, all that sort of thing, you want to do it before you start adding all this focus. All right. These are what I call focus nodes. Um, and this one's a little bit different with the desaturation. But if you want to add qualifiers, you want to do them, I usually do them after my first correction note. My first correction note adds contrast and saturation. So I'm going to double click on the first correction note and then press Alt S, and that's going to allow me to add a second note here. Then I might want to select his skin, click the eyedropper on his skin using this qualifier thing. Remember, I've covered all this stuff in great detail in a previous tutorial. Check that shit out. Shift H will turn that selection on and off. Let's narrow the selection to only show his skin. Um, then we can clean it up a little bit, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea, Shift H. Um, then we can add saturation to his skin, blah, 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 blah. Or in some cases, what I do is desaturate the skin, actually, make it like 40, and then push the color of skin that I want into it. Now, uh, one thing you will notice as well with this final shot is that his skin and that background um, curtain are quite different colors. So even though when I've created a selection here, it's pretty impossible to select his skin and the background separately. So I painstakingly um, went through, created a mask around him and selected them both separately. But you get the idea. Hopefully this tutorial has been um, entertaining at least. Um, I know I said it was only going to go for 15 minutes, but whatevs. Uh, yeah, I've been promising tutorials for a long time, but they're just, it's, they're hard. You have to perform. I, I just want it to be really good. So here's a shit one. Um, enjoy that. Peace out.